and so on. So thank you for listening to me. I hope you will enjoy all the papers. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker, our keynote speaker, the first speaker of our conference, um, Ivy Anderson, who has come all the way from California to be with us. Ivy is the Director of Collections at the California Digital Library. She has, um, I think, worked across the whole range of collections activities during her career. And um, you can read more about her in the brochure. But she's going to speak to us today, and I'm going to let her start now, um, by speaking about remembering your epiphanies collective management of print resources in the 21st century. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for inviting me to this wonderful conference and for inviting me to uh, uh, my first experience in, of Ireland and for the wonderful weather that you've all arranged for, for that. So um, it's a, a great, great pleasure to be here and I feel very honored to uh, be your first speaker of the morning. So remember your epiphanies. Um, I chose, I chose this quotation uh, from Joyce's Ulysses, um, partly because the language is so mysterious and evocative. <clears throat> what, what are these epiphanies on green oval leaves? Deeply deep, copies to be sent if you died to all the great libraries of the world, including Alexandria. Someone was to read them there after a few thousand years. I think I, this phrase, this, this passage, so beautifully encap encapsulates both the riches and the challenges of our print legacy, um, deeply important ideas that form the record or, of our intellectual heritage, disseminated in multiple copies throughout the world, to be safeguarded for posterity and for future generations to come. Well, those multiple copies that were once integral to the very notion of dissemination today present us with enormous challenges. As we grapple today with space and budgetary challenges and with our increasingly shi increasing shift from a, a print-based to a digital culture, a key challenge is how best to preserve and protect this intellectual legacy for the scholars of today and the historians of tomorrow. So before I go further, I should tell you a little bit about my own institutional context so you know uh, what I'm doing here and where I'm from. Um, the University of California, UC, is a 10-campus system, uh, often referred to as the largest public research university in the world. Um, the California Digital Library, where uh, I work and where our shared collections uh, coordination is situated, was founded in 1997 to develop uh, shared digital services for the university from online collections to innovations in scholarly communication. CDL services today span the entire research and de dissemination life cycle, including publication, data curation, content acquisition and management, including mass digitization, discovery and delivery services, and preservation. Oh, there we go. More relevant, more relevant perhaps for today's theme, Collaboration uh, has, long been, um, has long been part of the fabric of UC. Thanks to uh, the mandated uh, uh, master plan for higher education in the state of California. Uh, the master plan was developed in the 1960s and in the years following, the university's strategic approach to the development of library collections and services has emphasized multi-campus collaboration, application of new technologies, um, and expanded university-wide sharing of library collections. In the 1970s, triggered by the state's perception of substantial duplication among our 10 campus collections, or at that time our nine campus collections, a new plan was developed which catalyzed further collaboration through an online union catalog and associated resource sharing services. The state also funded the construction of uh, two regional library facilities, one in the north of California and one in the south. Our campuses are clustered in the north and the southern uh, parts of the state. 
uh, and the funding of those facilities was really intended to forestall future requests for expanded campus space. A successive planning extended the concepts of collaboration, sharing, and system-wide leverage into new domains of library service, including eventually the formation of the CDL. Uh, oops, wrong way. One additional note about the shared storage facilities that I mentioned, which sets the context for uh, much of what follows in my talk. If I can find my notes here, thank you. So um, this will set, probably sound very familiar to many of you in this room. Um, we in the University of California are running out of space. Um, both of our storage facilities are projected to be filled by 2019, that's uh, awfully close, uh, and we're urgently seeking funding for a new storage module in the north to extend their capacity. So this is very much the context that we're working in when we think about shared print collections. Jim Neal, the a university librarian emeritus at Columbia University, has said that cooperation is in the very DNA of libraries. In fact, libraries might be said to be the first true sharing economy long before the days of Uber or even Napster. Um, I love the discussion of the origins of collaboration uh, in the Roman era, and I'm going to extend that further in the modern era. So Rosabeth Cantor, a professor uh, of business at, Harvard, at the Harvard Business School, well known for her work on innovation and organizational change, tells us that successful organizational alliances are living systems that evolve. Uh, these alliances can exist on a continuum of weak to strong, from cooperative endeavors in which there's usually a value exchange of some sort, to true collaboration in which the parties build new value together and become increasingly interdependent. The most enduring collaborations, according to Cantor, uh, create a dense web of interpersonal connections and internal infrastructures that enhance learning with a high level of commitment that creates substantial change within each partner's organization. In other words, enduring collaborations create new value and interdependencies that lead to organizational change. So the digital era of online collections and mass digitization has provided a new context for such collaboration as never before. Um, as we all know, the internet removes many barriers and has fostered information exchange, information that can be anywhere and everywhere, and this creates a very different context in which we're all working. And there are many different examples upon which we might draw to highlight the ways in which networked information has fostered collaboration. Uh, but one prime example uh, of relevance to the topic of shared print collaboration is an organization known as Hathi Trust, which is um, a uh, shared digital library of Google Book scans and other mass digitized works founded in 2008 by the University of Michigan, the Committee for Institutional Cooperation, which is uh, a major research library consortium in the US Midwest, uh, and the University of California, all Google Books library partners. The impetus behind Hathi Trust was the desire to ensure the preservation under library control of the large and growing corpus of mass digitized books being digitized by Google and others, but also to test whether a shared collection of this nature could function at something approaching national scale. Could we really begin to build the collective collection that we all aspire to? Well, the Hathi Trust collection now contains nearly 15 million mass digitized texts, Nearly 5.6 million of those are fully, uh, fully viewable, and it counts some 114 members now, um, in the U both in the U.S. and abroad. Integral to the idea behind Hathi Trust was not only digital preservation and access, but also the idea that creating such a corpus would allow research libraries to manage their print holdings more effectively, and I'll return to that later on. Uh, but before delving into the print management implications of the Hathi Trust corpus, I'd like to share some examples of how Hathi Trust itself is engendering new types of collaboration and interdependencies among its partners. So the kinds of services that Hathi Trust uh, is enabling um, uh, combine discovery and access to print and digital versions in new ways. 
Uh, in one very common use case, library users can now not only find materials in remote storage through our library catalogs, but if the items are available in full view within Hathi Trust, they can also browse the full text through direct links in our catalog before deciding whether to actually request a physical item from our storage facilities. They can also go to Hathi Trust and search the full text directly there to make a decision about whether they actually need to recall uh, a pr print item. Uh, the full te text links um, may well have been scanned from another HathiTrust member's collection, need not be our collection, but they're now accessible to our users and other uh, libraries' users through our own online catalog. To, so to support this, we only need to make these linkages available in our discovery systems and make links back to our libraries available via HathiTrust. Fairly straightforward. More interestingly though, by pulling digital collections and building services like these on top of them, HathiTrust has also sparked new and deeper collaborations among its members. One of the most visible of these has been the Copyright Review Management System, a distributed crowdsourced project to resolve rights statuses for works of indeterminate copyright uh, involving the co coordinated effort of 20 HathiTrust partner institutions. Through this project, more than 300,000 works have been made available in full view for our users. This is work that can't be effectively done at the scale of a single institution, but which can be accomplished through coordinated action. This project was originally grant funded, but is now continuing, uh, albeit at a slower pace in a self-funded manner, and has created a toolkit to enable this work to continue. Uh, additional collaborative services spawned by Hadi Trust include the creation of a comprehensive corpus of US federal documents, a project that is just getting underway in earnest and which has been uh, a, a, a long, uh, long, li long cherished uh, aspiration of many, many libraries in the US, uh, as well as expanded access to materials for users with print disabilities and a certain protocol around that that makes that material available to print disabled users in our libraries. Uh, and that also has been an important policy goal for many. Through all of these projects, Hathi Trust partner institutions are building value in the combined corpus, engaging in new cooperative endeavors, and gaining new skills as a result. Eight years into this partnership, discontinuing Hathi Trust and returning these collections to solely local control would be unthinkable and a real diminution of value. So back to the print world. How is our work, uh, whoops, sorry. How has our work on collective collection building fared on the continuum from cooperation to collaboration? And here I'd like to go into a little bit of US library history, if you'll indulge me, um, because it's a, a rather checkered history, as you'll see. So historically, our collaborations have not fared very well, I'm afraid. Uh, I think this little history lesson may have something to teach us about what works and what doesn't work. So in the, in the US, research library expansion accelerated very rapidly beginning in the late 19th century with the development of land-grant universities and the rise of industrialization. Even then, as funding poured in to build up the research enterprise state by state, US libraries at the time recognized that they were building unsustainably duplicative collections and sought ways to coordinate their collecting efforts. The idea of a central national lending library uh, of the least frequently needed books consist, uh, was uh, a, an, uh, an idea that was floated by the librarian of Princeton University as far back as 1899. Uh, the idea was aimed at not just reducing duplication among, among the nation's research libraries, but also increasing the breadth of collections available nationally. These ideas were further taken up, <coughs> up by Harvard's then President Charles Eliot, who worried about the expense of duplicati duplicatively storing many little used, or as he called them, dead books. Well, these ideas failed to bear fruit um, for reasons that will sound very familiar today. There were recurring conflicts between local autonomy and centralized coordination. Due to the vagaries of funding at the national level, plans and proposals for national level coordination repeatedly fell through. And there was substantial resistance from faculty who insisted that these dead books were of critical importance to their scholarship. 
And also relevant in the US case is the federated nature of our political system. Without a national library to serve as a hub of collaboration, a collaborative action and funding, US libraries are left to their own devices and to philanthropy. So to, collect, to address the collection breadth problem, uh, a shared holdings catalog was later proposed as an alternative to a national repository system in order to support robust interlibrary lending of books. These ideas served the local context far better than the shared repository idea, resulting through many inter iterations in the shared catalogs and well-developed interlibrary loan systems that are an indispensable foundation of interlibrary cooperation today. And although the US Library of Congress played a role in those efforts, um, LC, uh, as its name denotes, was not chartered as a true national library, never developed a lending library function comparable, for example, to the British Library or other coordinated lending systems. So it's all uh, self-organized uh, activity uh, in, on our side of the pond. So in brief, the, the concerns that plague us today, expensive storage of duplicative collections that are little used or less and less used, uh, and concomitant degradation of broad collecting capability have been with us in the US for more than a century. And many of the challenges that bedeviled collaboration then, tensions between local autonomy, centralized planning, cyclical budget challenges, and the desire of faculty to keep collections close are issues that we struggle with today as we seek to transform the footprint of our libraries. A key takeaway in this is that the local context is all important. Collaboration works best when it supports a local imperative. Well, today, the advent of digital networks, if this is right, hello? Ah, no, wait. The advent of digital networks, the rise of online journals, and more recently, e-books, uh, and mass digitization of library collections have created new and seemingly more propitious conditions for collaborative action. Just as shared collections, uh, shared catalogs, excuse me, and resource sharing systems before them, collection digitization and online licensing are transforming the research library landscape of the 21st century, inching us closer to that elusive collective collection while providing new digitally oriented services to our users. So I'm going to discuss three types of print collaborations that are emerging today and try to suggest how each of these might lead us towards that deeper collect collaboration of the type that Jim Neal and Rosabeth Cantor envisioned. And for each, I will try to discuss what we know about these uh, activities, a little bit of landscape, what we've learned or are learning, and how these activities might begin to produce deeper change in our organizations. Some of the most uh, active and successful developments in the area of print collaboration are in shared journal archives, where the availability of online journal backfiles through projects like JSTOR and publisher backfile conversion have made retention of large print journal runs not only unnecessary, but an obvious target for solving uh, or addressing our significant space challenges. Targeting journal holdings for space reclamation is highly efficient because large amounts of space can be reclaimed through a limited number of individual title decisions. However, decessioning journals in an uncoordinated manner can also create duplicative effort while putting unique or scarcely held titles at risk. Um, an analysis by OCLC suggests that only 20% of the 5.5 million serial titles held in the WorldCat database have five or more holdings. So that is not really an, a great uh, amount of duplication. Um, although 20% of 5.5 million is still, still a large number. Um, meanwhile, the number of journal back files that we know to be digitally preserved are, are, are much smaller in the tens of thousands. But, so collaborative management of print journals is beginning to make real strides in the US as it is elsewhere, uh, for example, through the UK Research Reserve. Uh, some of these projects are centralized while others are distributed. Um, while there is some redundancy in the, uh, among the US programs, particularly for JSTOR titles, which have been, I think, the first target for many, many libraries, um, we found that these programs exhibit, uh, in other areas, surprisingly little duplication. Um, however, the opportunity for impact outside of these programs, where all of these holdings to be considered archives for the world, is enormous. There are eight, uh, almost eight and a half million library holdings worldwide for the titles that are held in the US archives that are enumerated here. But for that to happen, retention commitments have to be publicly known and uh, widely disclosed. The Western Regional Storage Trust, or WEST, 
um, is the home uh, is uh, the home of one such project, and it's based at the University of California. Wes grew out of earlier work within the UC system in partnership with JSTOR to validate a complete run of JSTOR journals to a very high standard. We felt we'd developed sufficient skill in this area to scale up to a larger project and realized that it was necessary to reach out beyond UC if this uh, were going to be financially feasible. West is a, a distributed archive and it seeks to build value for participating libraries through complementary investment. Some libraries agree to retain holdings based on the depth of their runs. Uh, others are compensate, and they are compensated for the, their validation and disclosure work. Uh, others contribute volumes to fill gaps, which they might otherwise deaccession. Um, all members gain access to the print volumes uh, for their users when needed. All members can compare their local holdings against the archive titles to identify potential deselection targets uh, when they wish to on their schedule. So nothing is required but the opportunity for uh, action through the collective uh, archive is, is there. And importantly, all members can participate in a new narrative within the academy that's not about deaccessioning collections, which I'm sure many of you agree is a very sensitive issue uh, among our faculty and our, our users, but uh, it's really about protecting and preserving those collections for future generations of scholars. So we, th we think of the narrative about shared print as not about reducing or eliminating collections, but it's about our shared stewardship mission. Um, so this is a, a bit of a, a little run through of what, what West consists of, 73 libraries throughout the western region of the United States, and you can see it's a very wide area, including um, Hawaii off to the, um, off to the left. Um, we're about to celebrate our 500,000th uh, archived volume, so it's a fairly uh, robust partnership. Um, and with a retention commitment of 25 years um, and the space savings potential if libraries in the partnership were to uh, deaccession their duplicative holdings is equivalent, we think, to about three or four mid-sized research libraries. So although we're not seeing that level of deaccessioning today, again, we're creating the opportunities for that kind of, um, that kind of action. West has several features that make it an interesting case study for collaboration. Uh, unlike some other U.S. projects, it began not with an, exist, uh, with an existing consortium. Well, I suppose it did because it began within the UC system, but it immediately reached out to a much broader uh, regional group. So um, I very, was very glad to hear the discussion of trust earlier because um, I also wanted to highlight trust as an important uh, f uh, a factor that one has to build into these kinds of partnerships. And trust was developed within what was originally an ad hoc group of libraries through careful planning, uh, routine, routine transparent procedures, and attention to the diverse benefits that each of the member libraries of different sizes and scales would obtain. Um, West also uses a data-driven collection analysis model, which has allowed it to achieve scale more quickly than it might otherwise have. So we have a system that turns through data and, and provides us with lots of lists to work, work with. Um, I will say West is currently going through a challenging phase in which we're transitioning from grant support to a member-supported model. And this has required us to think even more deeply about the benefits of particip participation for different types of libraries. So in light of the future sustainability challenges and the need to scale our work even further, um, just as our local work with JSTOR prompted us to launch a regional partnership, we're now in discussions with other regional journal archives in the US to explore opportunities for collaboration at a broader quasi-national level. These discussions are currently centered on the possibility of developing shared infrastructure to help us scale up even further. So West has collection analysis function that we have developed. Uh, some other partners have developed uh, systems that allow one to disclose gaps and fill gaps. And there are a variety of systems that are developing that we think could be knitted together to create uh, even broader value. So now let's move uh, to a little bit of a discussion of, of monographs. Monographs present us with really an entirely different set of challenges. So unlike journals, uh, user acceptance of online monographs as a replacement for print um, has only progressed modestly in the last decade. So there's continuing demand for print. Um, 
There's low uh, electronic availability for the long tail of uh, in copyright uh, print monographs. Um, the retrospective space reclamation opportunities are considerably less compelling for monographs because of the overhead of individualized decision making for individual titles. And, the, and that significant overhead is also a break on collective action. Um, and yet, um, use of, uh, of print monographs is low and is declining. Uh, their numbers are very large. Um, and this uh, does create an opportunity for uh, this uh, increasing our collaboration and as well as an imperative to, to manage costs and manage space. So as I said, the, um, the um, uh, acceptance of online monographs as a replacement for print has not progressed very far in the last decade. Um, this is a rather dense slide that probably you will find more easier to read uh, when you download them and read them locally than it'll appear on the screen. Uh, but it's a few data points from the recent uh, uh, survey that the Ithaca SNR, a, a major uh, research uh, organization in the US, uh, conducts every year on faculty, uh, faculty um, uh, uh, attitudes about various trends in library service. And what they found in their most recent survey is that although there had been some progression over the last few years in user uh, acceptance of or ex expectation that the value of print would decline, that seems to be leveling off quite a bit. Uh, print is still the preferred medium for reading and for close study. Um, but ebooks are, are still highly valued by ma faculty and other users, especially for searching and quick lookup. So print and digital formats can be expected to remain in an ease, uneasy and complementary relationship really for the foreseeable future. Uh, many monographs are also uniquely or scarcely held in libraries. So for monographs, it's the retention commitment as libraries begin to refigure the, reconfigure their environments. Um, retention of scarcely held copies is another key goal for monographic collaboration. And finally, shared uh, 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 strategies for monographs, as I said, can be, can be uh, costly due to the overhead of decision making for large numbers of individual titles. Um, at the University of California, uh, I will say we've struggled uh, because of all of these factors to identify a use case for shared retrospective monographic uh, management that provides sufficient cost benefit for collaboration. However, there are some very successful uh, shared monograph uh, projects that are developing in the US. Um, the most uh, successful of these to date um, has been the analytic service provided by Sustainable Collection Services, now a unit of OCLC, which provides uh, reports of collection overlap and associated data such as circulation history among designated groups of libraries, again, trusted networks of libraries. Uh, frequently, these are existing consortia, but some are, um, as West was, larger ad hoc groups that are uh, building uh, trust and collaborative relationships as well. One of the largest and most recent in the US uh, is the East Project, a neat counterpart to West, and we're quite sure that they chose the name East because we had chosen the name West for our journals project, um, which will establish um, a dist distributed retention commitments across a very wide area um, in the, the eastern part of the US. Um, it's the, to date the largest monographic project in the US with 41 libraries and 25 million uh, title holdings spread across multiple states. And just announced this week in the UK, which uh, no doubt many of you uh, have seen um, uh, and are familiar with, the White Rose Consortium is embarking on a very similar project, again, with sustainable collection services. So as with West, we've learned in these projects that data analytics are important to working with very large bodies of material. Uh, also important is the preservation of local autonomy. Um, local holdings in these projects are again subject to local decision making. The data analytics tell the, the group what is where the overlap is, what is little used, where the opportunities are for retention commitments, where, where the unique holdings are, and then decisions. Um, some decisions are made collaboratively and other decisions are made locally. One of the most ambitious projects soon to be launched uh, in this, er uh, er uh, this uh, area is the Hathi Trust Shared Monographs Initiative. Um, and so coming back to Hathi Trust, this is uh, an initiative designed to establish retention commitments among major research libraries at the national scale of Hathi Trust. Um, a year-long planning task force identified a couple of key goals for this project. 
Uh, one, to uh, achieve very rapid uptake and scale in as short a period of time as possible. So the goal, the idea here is to secure retention commitments for as many as three million titles uh, within a short space of time largely uh, leveraging uh, the existing uh, infrastructure of shared repositories uh, in uh, major research libraries in the US. And a second uh, proposal is to deploy shared infrastructure for disclosing these retention commitments and making ongoing commitments. So one of the, one of the um, uh, fact, facts and factors that makes this project seem feasible uh, and promising is the very high degree of overlap uh, among uh, U.S. research library collections with the HathiTrust corpus. Um, as you can see uh, in this slide, the, the overlap uh, with these uh, among these collections is very high. Right now, the median duplication rate, actually, I had a later slide uh, than this one. This shows as of 2010, the median duplication rate was 31 percent, but I believe now it's up to uh, 50 or even, uh, even 60 percent. So a very high degree of overlap between research library collections and the HathiTrust corpus. Uh, as in earlier attempts at national coordination, though, whether this project succeeds remains to be seen. It's still in the planning stages. Um, but the significant overlap, as I said, makes this very promising. Some of the key questions that this initiative uh, will have to face. Um, Will, will the research libraries, in fact, be incentivized to commit their holdings? Many of them are retaining these holdings, but what do they gain by disclosing that as a formal commitment? The project is going to have to think about what the incentives are for, for participation for the, the large research libraries. Um, what about the non-research libraries, the smaller libraries? Will they uh, be incentivized to participate in some way, perhaps to become HathiTrust members, in order to take advantage of retain monographs and receive services uh, in, with respect to the shared uh, a corpus, the, the, the retained corpus? Um, similarly to how such incentives have developed for uh, the uh, shared journal programs. So although within the University of California we've struggled with shared monographs projects, we think participation in the HathiTrust project will be more successful and more valuable for us because it will, it will rely upon and integrate well with the nature and operation of our regional storage facilities, which are already persistent holdings. This leads me to uh, the final use case for shared print collaboration, and that is a shared storage. So Lizanne Payne, a, a major a consultant in the shared print area in the US, has done a lot of work in this area. And this is a quote from uh, a study that she did in 2007 of storage facilities in the US. Um, and what she posits um, is, um, and this is sort of the punchline of this, this section of the, of the talk, um, that we can provide lasting benefits if we um, develop a, a, a cooperative or collaborative print repository network among our libraries um, on the regional, national, or global scale, uh, uh, starting with uh, the repositories that um, we all have. So um, uh, despite the desire um, to place more of our collections in shared storage facilities where the cost of keeping a book is far lower than it is on site in our campus facilities, um, the declining demand for print makes the significant capital investments required uh, to invest in new facilities very difficult to justify. So I mentioned at the outset that the UC facilities are running out of space, and we have been working for years to try and build support for a new facility, and so far we're only inching towards that goal. Um, uh, so in the, in the U.S., there are uh, other projects, as I know has been the case here as well, um, where there are st uh, shared storage facility plans in waiting that have yet to be funded, ready to go whenever our, our funders uh, uh, hand over the money. Um, but to many administrators and governing bodies, um, and even to some observers within our own community, online collections and shared storage um, look like alternatives, not complementary strategies. Um, even though the, we know that the, the storage capacity of existing facilities is running dangerously low. We have at UC very recently been successful in uh, bringing uh, to the attention of our president um, of the university the urgency of our need for expanded sh uh, shared storage. So we may begin to see some movement in this direction uh, uh, in, in the near future, we, we hope. Um, 
I think receptivity to this request at the presidential level is attributable to several factors. Um, we presented a very clear narrative about the relationship of print to digital, including where and why print is still needed. Um, we were able to make a very strong case about the uh, and demonstration of the success and efficiency of existing collaboration throughout our system uh, in many, many different areas, which gave, gives credibility to our proposed solution. Um, and we also coupled that with a commitment to continue to find efficiencies in the form of deduplication of existing facilities and additional shared strategies. So in short, um, we told a good story um, of the kind that university administrators like to hear. Um, of course, we're, st we're still at the request stage. Um, the amount of funding we've requested is low, um, but the, the difficulty of gaining a hearing for even this straightforward expansion uh, uh, was uh, very illustrative of the, the challenges that we face collectively. So many of the developments um, in shared storage today, actually I will skip through this slide, this is just an illustration of the numerous shared storage or storage facilities that we have um, in the US. These are uh, uh, pictures of shared storage facilities, both the UC ones as well as um, the RECAP facility owned by Princeton, uh, Columbia, and NYPL, um, and several others. But there are actually many other uh, sh uh, storage facilities that are not shared facilities that are um, individual facilities. Um, but many of, the, many of the developments in shared storage today, uh, because of the difficulty of uh, getting support for new building projects, involve reconfiguration rather than new facilities. And uh, perhaps the most interesting case study of this nature is RECAP, uh, the shared storage facility jointly owned by Princeton, Columbia, and NYPL, New York Public Library. Uh, with support from the Andrew, uh, Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, RECAP is reconceptualizing the nature of its collections and services from inde independent collections housed in a shared facility. So a shared facility, but each of the partners housing its own collections, no attempt to rationalize or deduplicate. Um, and they are changing that to um, an explicitly shared collection and associated services that will be built upon the shared collection. And this again is a project that has been a number of years in planning with a lot of work to develop uh, policies, procedures, uh, ideas about how this would work. Uh, RECAP is also interesting because it's a unique case in the U.S. of uh, a shared storage facility that's self-funded by its partners rather than ma mandated and funded from on high. And so again, this was a facility that was responsive to a uh, local desire to, to um, uh, collaborate on uh, low-cost shared storage. But such policies of reconfiguration from shared storage to shared collections um, are being developed at many other uh, storage facilities uh, in the US. Uh, the Washington Research Libraries Consortium, uh, for example, is developing a very similar project. Um, um, at the University of California, where our, our shared storage facilities already worked in a, a, collab a, a cooperative manner, um, there still is duplication across the facilities, and we are now um, working to remove that duplication across the facilities to gain more space, and also to bring our catalogs together. Each of the facilities used a different catalog, and we have a proposal now to integrate them into one catalog so that we will have a more unified environment for collection analysis, collection decision making, uh, and so forth. And if our shared, uh, our proposal for a shared expansion uh, module uh, in the north is, is funded, that's the proposal that we now have before the president, um, that, will, that facility will serve both our northern and southern campuses. So again, we are also are working towards a more integrated, more shared uh, facilities. So it doesn't look at the moment as if shared, new shared storage is likely to be in many of our futures. Um, the, I will say that the Council on Library and Information Resources, uh, a major thought leader, uh, uh, thought leadership organization in the U.S., um, is uh, developing an outline or a proposal uh, designed for a shared repository infrastructure. Um, I have yet to see anything about that project. I believe uh, we may see something about that soon. And so um, if CLEAR can come up with proposals and find funding for them, that might accelerate some of the work that we're all trying to do. But given the unlikely prospects for new facilities, um, libraries are really going to have to implement shared collection approaches largely by reconceptualizing the infrastructures that we have today, uh, building in deeper collaboration um, across both our storage facilities and our, our on-site facilities. Um, another, another way that we have built this kind of 
uh, uh, collaboration into the UC fabric is as our storage facilities have been running down on space, we now have also a policy called shared print in place where we commit shared, we commit uh, holdings to at our campuses, but we commit them to the same degree of persistence and permanence and uh, shareability across the, the system as the facility, the, um, the copies that are in our storage facilities. So we are beginning to use our campus infrastructure as a part of that shared infrastructure. So just some final thoughts. That was um, a quick, may I hope it wasn't too dry, but a sort of an overview of several important strategic kinds of projects that we're working on, each of which I think is headed towards deeper collaboration that has the promise and holds the potential to build deeper, more interdependence among our institutions that will be hard to move away from if we can make it happen. So a few, no a few final thoughts about all of this. In thinking about the different kinds of uh, collaborations that we're engaged uh, in, um, there are different goals that are served by the different kinds of collaboration. So I've talked uh, exclusively about retrospective collections uh, today. There are, of course, also projects that work on prospective collecting uh, that is uh, done collaboratively and in a shared manner. And if you think about the different kinds of functions and, and, and benefits that are provided in each of those kinds of collecting, it helps to think about and develop models and design, design projects around how those uh, different kinds of collaborations can work. So thoughtful design um, is, uh, is part, of the, part of the picture. Uh, ensuring trust, again, is a, a very important part of the picture. Trust helps with um, uh, the sustainability of all of these projects. In some of our earlier work within UC, um, we've thought about what it takes to engender trust in organizations. And of course, a lot of it is um, working together and building a, chair, a collaborative a framework. Um, but we've identified several um, areas where um, infrastructure and specific you know, specific areas can support and and uh, build trust. So one is standards, for example. If, some, if things behave the way you expect them to behave, you have standards for disclosure, you have standards for validating journal archives, for example. What do you look at? How do you, how do you, how do you anoint a particular journal holding as being good or good enough? And what kinds of standards do you apply? Um, disclosing those commitments and being very transparent so that there's a lot of transparency in what you do. Um, and building a collections and services that um, uh, services that have a lot of reliability. So um, in some of our projects, in our West project, for example, there are archiving cycles that behave a particular way. We've gone through, I think we're going into our fifth archiving cycle now. Everyone knows how to do this. Everyone knows what to do. It's become a routine and reliable process. Oh, I didn't realize this was one of those <laughs> slides. So yes, so here are some of the things I was calling out. Um, uh, so page validation protocols for standards, bibliographic conventions, um, <clears throat> ensuring that there's disclosure uh, and transparent processes. Um, uh, retention policies is another area of re reliability. If you know how long something is going to be retained, you will be able to rely on that um, more easily than if you just know that someone is, is keeping it somewhere. So there are ways that we can structurally build in mechanisms that will, in fact, build trust in our networks. And then finally, um, remember, uh, my, my, my key thoughts, remember these epiphanies. Um, collective action, I believe, must respect and be sensitive to the local context. Um, uh, allowing for auto local autonomy within a shared framework um, is a, a very good approach to getting buy-in across a broad set of institutions. It's very difficult to come along and say, thou shalt, but um, creating an opportunity for institutions to behave in ways and at the rates that they that they choose to um, is a, a very a, um, a helpful way to proceed. <clears throat> and then this notion again that enduring co collaborations are ones that create new value and interdependencies, and that's where the systemic change in our organizations will happen. So with that, um, I thank you very much for your time and attention. And thank you for taking the questions. <laughs>